Nick and Molly just moved to the city and can't agree on what they want. They are young and energetic and looking for a new church home. We'll take some personality tests, tour the sites, ask some questions, and based on taste, experience, and location, we'll find them the perfect congregation. I'm Corey Clark, and welcome to Church Hunters. We're so excited to find a church. We just started dating. Um, with the churches we go to now, just not, like for us, just not really doing it for us, you know? Right, I, I go to a satellite campus. I just find it hard to connect emotionally with a video screen, it's just. Okay, you cried during Cake Boss. So like, we've been doing a lot of services online, a lot of podcasts. There are a lot of preachers we do like. Really good, but we want, we want serious yet funny. Yeah, like commanding of the stage yet relatable, you mm -hmm. know? We're more looking for uh, the humor of Andy Stanley with the body of Stephen Furtick. Hey guys, what's happening? I'm Corey. Good to see you, my name's Nick, this hey, is Molly. Molly. Hey guys, welcome to Church Hunters. This is your first church, this is Creekside First Baptist. So while it is traditional, it's still pretty current. Just okay. this year, the pastor started untucking his shirts. Oh, Ooh, wow. that's good. Oh, big deal. He does dress his age though, so don't worry. He's past the Osteen suit phase, but he hasn't gone full Giglio yet. Okay, oh. so his holes in the knees or no? Well, it's frayed, but no holes. Frayed, oh. no, okay, got it, yeah. perfect. Okay. So hey, let me show you around, okay? Right, let's Come on. do it. I do love this lobby. It's a great lobby, you know? Yeah. It's not too big, not too small, yeah. it should be enough room to catch up, chat with your friends, you but here's a great thing. There's a bunch of side exits, so if you need to leave early and catch the game, you can do that. Got it. Yes. Yeah. Honestly, right up front, uh, didn't love the name. No, I, First Baptist? Who names a church that anymore? I just... Not these days. We're looking no. for like a Thrive Church, maybe Relevant Church, I don't know, Radiant Church, something. This is the soundboard they use here. Okay. Now remember, it's pretty traditional here, so when Sunday comes around, they turn it way down low. Got it. <laughs> yeah. But the one knock on this church, they still use the child care numbering system on the screens. Ooh, oh. for the yeah. yeah. Or as the moms like to call it, the sanctuary walk of shame. Yeah. <laughs> the Sunday morning experience was just a little too traditional for, for us. For us. I mean, the pastor's main point, 157 characters. I can't tweet that. Yeah. I really think you guys are going to love this place. I like we it. We do. We like Feels it. Great. Yeah. You know, it's diverse, but it's not like too diverse, you know? Um, scripture heavy sermons? Oh, or, yeah. 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 What about, uh, is it community oriented? Absolutely. Great. Oh, women in ministry? The parking situation, you guys gotta see it. Super rare nowadays. Come with me. There's like a, a maybe for when my parents we'll come into maybe. town yeah. for a church for Christmas. Easter type of church. Like a holiday Holidays. type church. One of the main reasons that I love this church for you guys is that on your personality test, Molly, you scored high in service and hospitality. Oh, babe. And there's wow. a great welcome team you could join. Perfect. Okay. And then Nick, you scored really high in need for accountability. Wow. And the men's groups here are amazing. You're just, you're just gonna put that out there? Hey, just God like knows that? your heart, okay? On the next episode of Church Hunters. I think you're really gonna love this place. They take relevance to a whole new level. This church identifies as interdenominational. This pastor speaks out of a brand new translation. It's the Tumblr Bible. I'm gonna get you to turn the lights down on me a little bit. It's so bright here, I can already see my notes. Now, I didn't play that video to make any specific point except to say that Everywhere today in society, people are looking for a certain style or a certain way. I didn't put it in there about because it talks about women in ministry and like that. This was given to me uh, about nine, ten months ago. And I had kept it. And when I was doing my message, I thought, man, this would be really good with this message. And so what I'm saying to you today is society is changing and so is church. And, uh, but the gospel remains the same, folks. It doesn't change. And the message can change, uh, can't change, but the method can, they say. But I tell you one method that can't change is giving people Jesus Christ. And I believe that with all my heart. And I believe we're trying to take sometimes secular solutions and expecting spiritual results. And as I traveled this week, so often at, you know, just different conversations with different people that we had dinner and that with, and I think sometimes... Uh, we can't figure out where the church is going. We're not quite sure what God is doing in the church. We have a little bit of amnesia. But I believe God wants to let us know very clearly what he said in the word of God about what the church needs to be. And it's only what he declares works that works. Amen? 
And so this morning, I want to, the title of my message is All of Jesus for Everyone. And the one thing that I recognize over and over, I do not have enough talent. I do not have enough charisma. I don't have enough of anything to give to people that will solve their problems. But Jesus Christ is everything. And if I give them Jesus Christ, I've given them everything. If I give them the word of God, it's everything. Amen? And so we have to continue. No matter what method we use, we got to make sure that the method says it's all about Jesus. It's not about how well I can write a play. It's not about how well I can play an instrument. It's about am I glorifying Jesus Christ while I'm doing it? Does the play produce Jesus Christ so somebody is being brought to Jesus? Here at MGA, we are helping one another, I think, pursue God's best presenting the gospel as truthfully and as fully as possible. And that's what I'm about. I really believe that. I believe God doesn't let me get away with preaching it any other way. It's a place of love and acceptance. We have to have grace. That's what Jesus gives to you and I. But it's also a place of privilege, folks, and responsibility. And sometimes we've left that out. We, we parent today with the same kind of methods that we parent with a lot of love and we pat our kids on the back for everything they're doing, but very little discipline sometimes. And uh, when we had Father's Day, when Justin spoke, he said, and don't forget to discipline your children. When he came off the pulpit, I said to him, Justin, that's the most profound thing you could ever say. I don't mean that we have to go harsh about disciplining our children, but there's got to be boundaries. God puts boundaries around you and I, and so he shows us. And any good family has all four components, I believe, when we have love and acceptance, but also a place of privilege that you know it's a privileged place to be in the family, but also you are responsible that you have chores. There's things that you have to do within the family. We're passionate about MGA being a place we call home. That's been our are saying for years, and I remember, I think it was Pastor Greg Fraser who um, came up with the title and whatever at the time, and I remember, well, he's taken it to his church, as you know, but it's a place, folks, where we believe in a real God, a real God who really cares and gets stuff done. So many churches today, I believe it's a gathering place, it's great that way, but they're not seeing miracles, they're not seeing life-changing situations. And I believe with all my heart, that's the one thing here at this church, and I say it to you from a good heart. Yesterday, coming up the highway, I'm coming back, and four text messages came in. Pastor Bev, can I meet you on Monday? 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 I'm having marriage trouble. I'm having this. I'm having that. Listen, the only thing that sets people free when they come through that office door, the only thing that I can present is the truth of the gospel. And when I present it, you do not know. I said, we're going to put a box here for miracles because the week before, I must have had five or six people come and say, Pastor Bev, you guys prayed for this, and it's done. It was done before I even got home. And that's what God is doing. He's changing life by life by life by speaking the truth in love. When you talk about marriages, you've got to say to our men, I said to a young man that was in my office last week, and he, he had screwed up in his marriage. He said that he had. But I said, listen, do you go to church? Well, I haven't gone that much. My job has become priority. I said, wrong move. Right? You need to come to church with your family. You lead by example. Do you pray with your family? No, I don't have the courage to do that. Well, you've got to start. It's not a big thing, but you've got to start. We've got to start praying. We've got to start doing the things that are right. Amen? And I meet sometimes, and I think marriage is under attack, because I, in my office, several times in a week, I'll deal with three or four people that are saying, I'm having trouble in my marriage. But thank God people are coming. Folks, people are coming and saying, what do I do? How would I get on track with God? What do I do about it? Because that shows me that God is dealing with them internally at their own homes and saying, I need to come and get help. Amen? So this morning, don't ever be afraid to come and ask for help. None of us got it perfect. We have not worked it out, folks. All of us have marriage situations. All of us have kids situations. All of us have something on our plate that we have to deal with. 
But who do we run to? We run to God. So what's God's heart for the church? Is he just interested in a big gathering of people to come out? Well, it's summertime. You can see seats empty. So many people gone for the entire summer. Is he interested in a gathering? Or is he interested in godly living? God wants to. The reason why he has a church, he wants to reveal Jesus' glory through you and I. That's his purpose for having you and I here. Otherwise, he could have stayed and done it all himself. But he said, I'm going to continue my ministry through you. The last time I spoke was on the book of Acts, the first chapter. Talked about how the apostles and the disciples at that time expected Jesus to stay. After he rose from the dead, they expected him to stay and set up his kingdom. They thought, well, surely now that he's risen from the dead, he will set up his kingdom. And Jesus said, no, I'm going to commission you, and you're going to go. But I'm going to first send the Holy Spirit that's going to work through you so that you can be Jesus to somebody else. So we can't do it on our own. No, much, no matter how much we try, no matter how talented we are, we cannot. It's the work of the Holy Spirit, and only the Holy Spirit can draw men and change lives. So he says, but I'm going to make you an extension of myself. I'm going to go prepare a place for you, and I'm going to make you an extension of my ministry. How many can say truthfully this morning that you are doing a ministry, that you're an extension of the work of God? Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, let's read it this morning. So Christ gave himself, the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole me measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So how does God enable the body of Christ? What's his way of equipping the body? Well, the gifts are the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, slash teachers. It's not administration, though they're gifts and they're used within the body, but it's these that he's given to the church. And sometimes there's such a lack of appreciation, folks, for these gifts within the church. And I say that very humbly, but, you know, the Bible talks about double honor. And I want you to be careful. In Canadian society, we don't tend to be under authority much. A lot of different cultures talk about being under authority, and a lot of different cultures teach me how to be respectful, even towards my peers, in working with them, the way that they live their life. I go some places, and, and, and not that we need this, but I, I've gone to other churches in the city, where they will usher you in. I mean, don't get me wrong. You don't need all that as a person to do the gospel. But they, they, there's such a respect for who you are and what you do. And so often, like Derek and I would say, no, we don't need that, folks. We don't need any of that. But yet there's no, Pastor Bev, we, we, they even carry your bags. Now, I don't know that that's necessary because, you know, we go from one extreme to the other. But all I'm saying is there's a balance somewhere in the middle where we have respect for people that are serving in the house of God. And I really believe that that needs to come back to some extent. Not for myself. I think about the people that work with me and work endless hours doing stuff. And then I hear sometimes people criticize them. And I'm very, I, I get a little bit defensive because they've become my brothers and sisters. And so sometimes, and we in the church, you see, we don't go out and defend ourselves. We can't get into all that, but we are to uphold the body of Christ. What's the purpose for the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and teachers? Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do the work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. Like I said, I don't believe that skits and all of these things or anything else can replace or do what God is allowing the church to have. If he's given the church prophets and evangelists and teachers and that, we've got to be careful and make sure that that becomes a prime target. How do we equip God's people to build up the body of Christ? So how do myself as a pastor, how do I equip you? 
What am I supposed to do? What does the scripture say? Well, the first thing is it says that I'm to promote spiritual maturity. A lot of people don't like to grow up. You ever have kids that don't want to grow up? There's kids today, I heard a story not long ago, not a word of a lie, this kid was 32 years of age, still living in his parents' home. And they're trying to find a way to get him out. And they're coming up with every scheme possible. And finally, they just took his bedroom, took everything out of it, and extended their bedroom to this large bedroom. When he came back, he said, there's no bedroom here for you. You have to go. You just have to go. But isn't that true? And sometimes we're like that spiritually. We have to teach our children, folks, as parents, to grow up, to mature, so that they can be responsible, productive with their lives. And only then do we find the joy of the Lord. Because in that purpose, in being responsible, we find God. We get, we get to know who God is. God allows us. He says, without vision, without purpose, the people perish. So we need to get it. And if we, as pastors and preachers, teachers, if we do not live out our calling, then the church is weak. I believe that with all my heart. And if a pastor believes the church can grow because of his own abilities, I believe the church can fall. What? We can all make big congregations. That's the truth. I believe that. We can build big infrastructures. We can go to the bank, build money, and build bigger and better and do more and more. But that's not Christ's fullness. Just because you have a big building doesn't mean that the body is full of Christ, that we're living it out right. So the gospel tells us that it's not in those things. It's, it's in the gifts that God gave to bring unity to the church. So we must follow God's way of doing things. Our goal is not just to get to pe people out to church. Now, two Sundays ago, Sundays ago, that's what I spoke on, inviting people to church. How do we do that? But that's not our entire goal. When, once we get them here, we have to re be responsible to teach them and get them serving in the body of Christ. That's the only way that they're going to be content. So sometimes we don't invite people to church because it's too much work on our shoulders because we got to babysit a little bit, right? You, you invite the alcoholic off the street. He's not coming in just overnight and being cleaned up. So we've got to be there with them. We've got to help clean them up. We've got to help teach them. We've got to go the distance with them. But sometimes that's too much work for us, especially when we want to get out and go on vacation or do the next thing or the next thing. So we think, we look and we think, how many times have you passed somebody on the street? I remember being down in Los Angeles on the beach and um, seeing, you know, people just shoving drugs into their veins on Venice Beach, and myself and Derek there, and I'm saying, Derek, we should go over and pray. It was so hard to know what to do. Should you go? Should you reach out? Could you really believe that God would heal this person? Would you really, if you went over there, would God actually do something? And so often you back away, and pastors back away, and people back away from the difficult things because we think, you know, if God don't show up, we're on our own here. But it's not my responsibility to heal anybody. It's just my responsibility to, to go, to pray, to teach, to speak the word of God. And folks, today, we need a real relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the thing that's missing most of all, I believe. And I say that with all my heart. You're seeing it in society. Marriages are breaking down. Children are being rebellious. Society is being rebellious. And so you ask yourself, what's the reasoning? Well, the Bible tells you very clearly it's because the church is not what it should be. Because, you know, in darkness, if we shine bright enough, we will dispel the darkness. So we need to shine. We need to be a people. And I say to you today, and not, this is not a con condemning message, because I take this to heart myself. I start to analyze my own life and say, God, how much praying am I doing? What am I doing? And not, I never live in condemnation. I, don't, I refuse to. If I make a mistake, I say, God, I made a mistake. I get on to it tomorrow. Because God said to me years ago, Beverly, if you get <laughs> dwelling on your mistake and you're into tomorrow, I cannot use you tomorrow. Get past it. Ask for forgiveness. Try to do what's right tomorrow. Move past it. Move in power. Move in might. Get out there. Do what you need to do. There's a devil that keeps us down. 
It's the devil that comes along and lets you hear what somebody's saying about you folks. It's the devil who tells you you're no good. But Jesus says, I'm fighting for you to the very last day. I will take you. I will go down to the pits of hell and pull you up if I got to. I will fight for you that much. How many wants a God like that, that you could serve a God like that? Our confidence is in God. But let me tell you, there's some things we can do that will help us be a people of God. And that is get on our knees and pray. I don't mean we literally got to get down for hours. You can walk the floor. You can do what you like. We're not praying like we used to pray. Don't care what anybody says. My dad, I remember I was only a little girl before he died, but I remember walking past our living room early in the morning, and my dad's feet would be sticking out by the door. He'd be down on his knees praying for his family, and he prayed for hours, folks. My mom, every night of my life, even when I wasn't a Christian, I would walk up over the stairs. Night after night, I would hear her say, and God, please bring Beverly back. Do you think maybe her prayers had something to do with me standing here? Maybe my dad's prayers over us as kids, even though he passed away, do you not think that God did not hear my dad's prayers over me and over my family? And I believe with all of my heart that prayer still works, folks. You might not get out to prayer meeting. You might not like the style of the prayer meeting. You might not understand the people who's doing the prayer meeting. You might not want the people that's doing the prayer meeting. But prayer works. So get yourself out to prayer. Pray. Pray at your dinner table. Pray with your kids. Teach them to pray. We go out to dinner now. We're at a restaurant. Sometimes we're afraid to bow our head. We were at the keg the other night, Derek and I, in Edmonton. And he took off his cap and he said, Bev, let's pray. And he kissed my hand and he thanked God for our relationship and we prayed together. When I opened my eyes, I don't tell you that to say that we prayed, but when I opened my eyes, there was a table of five elderly people across. And I seen a woman wiping the tears out of her eyes. You can affect people wherever you are. You don't have to try to be a superhero. You just got to be in love with Jesus Christ. You got to want him. You got to live him. You got to be him wherever you go. And when people don't understand you, you can't help that. You just got to pray and bless people. You know, Derek and I, sometimes I get criticized. We all do in life. But sometimes when people come against me in the air, you know, my husband's instinct is to pick up for me. And I say, no, we can't do that. You and I are going to bow our knee now. We get down and we bless people. We say, God, whatever, they, whatever the motive is of their heart is, that's okay, but bless them. The Bible says, bless those who despitefully use you. It's a different method of thought. But we choose to bless people. Bless people, folks. Don't curse people. Get on your knees. Bless people. We're to balance truth with love. We need honest and loving relationships. And that's gone out of families. We're afraid to tell our kids anymore what we think. Because we think, well, if we say the wrong thing, they might not come around. But you know what happens? Yeah, sometimes they'll distance themselves for a little bit. But then all of a sudden, they run into trouble. They run into the muck and the mire of life. And they think, I can run back to mom. I can run back to dad because they tell me the truth. And I've had that happen so many times in life. Even with people in the congregation, you tell them what they don't want to hear, but you say, but this is the Bible. I'm telling you a little love. You've got to go this way. And within no time, I remember my cousin, she, she still doesn't profess to know Jesus Christ. When I'm around her because of her defenses, time and time again, she'll start putting the church down, especially knowing that I'm a minister. She'll say, I don't know about all that stuff, Bev. I don't know if I care about that stuff. And I said, yeah, but you know what? When we really need Jesus, we call out to him. I pray that if you ever need him, you call out to him. You know what? <laughs> One night, last year, my phone rang about 3 o'clock in the morning, and the sobs on the other end of the phone were so overwhelming to me. I couldn't think, who is this person? And I kept saying, who are you? 
can I help you? And all I got was sobs and sobs and sobs. And finally, she got herself together enough. And she said who she was. And she said, I need prayer. I need prayer. I need prayer. They will come. They will come when they need prayer. The vehicle of growth, folks, is to tell the truth in love. I had a friend. I tell stories because I believe stories tells us how God works. I had a friend who was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, when she got the news, my sister phoned and said, you need to go right there, Bev. She's, she's devastated. And the people around her, her family and friends, uh, of course, were believing for a miracle. But when I stepped over the threshold of her door, I heard God say to me, her days are numbered. And I thought, God, why would you tell me that? I don't want to hear that right now. This is a good friend of mine. It's just fresh on me as well. I don't need to know that she's going to pass away. And I was looking at her so intense that she looked back at me and she said, what are you looking at, Bev? And I said, well, you've lost some weight, that kind of thing. And she said, you sure? But you know, God, because he put this in my heart, one day I thought I got to go back up and talk to her and I got to be truthful, not to tell her that she, you know, I thought she was going to pass away, but to ask her if she was ready to meet the Lord and all that. And so I went up, I made an appointment to go up to her home. And I say appointment because you're only allowed in at certain times she was sick. And uh, I asked her, I said, you know, what are you going, how are you feeling if God decides to take your life? And her and I had a great time of praying and, and uh, I felt that she got what I was saying. And she looked at me, she said, Beverly, I can't comprehend it, but I know that, you know, God sent you here today. Well, it was only a few weeks later, I'm in Edmonton for a grandchild's birth, and I just seen the baby being born. Got the phone call again that she was only given weeks to live. They phoned me again, could you get right over to this hospital? So we went there. And when I went in, Everybody around her was still saying the same thing. You will be healed. You will be healed. And she looked at me, knowing what we had talked about, and very quietly between her and I. She said, Beverly, this is it. You know it. I know it. Could you pray for me to have the strength to get through? While everybody else around her was saying, no, you will live. You will live. Come on, fight. Come on, eat. Come on, do this. Come on, do that. She knew that God was going to take her home. Honesty, folks, when it really matters, really matters to people. You know, when you're, we're only a hospital for the sick. And when you're really sick, when you know that your time, what do you do to a doctor? You don't say, you know, just sugarcoat it all for me. You say, tell it to me straight. I want to know the truth of, the, of what you're saying. Because I want to make things right with my family. I want to make things right with life. And so we're no different. I think most people, when, when life becomes so difficult, you want the truth. Churches that are growing in God, I believe, are honest about who God is and what God can do. And God is the answer. It's challenging, folks. But it's a vital necessity within the church that we, this word of God, is preached in fullness. Not bits and pieces, so it satisfies us but that we know this is the answer to everything in life. Everything. We can't change our beliefs just to be modern, but yet we know that God is contemporary. We know he's relevant. and We have to keep up with that, but we do not want to change the message. We are truth against the lies of the enemy. We're the light in the darkness. The truth is irrelevant. I mean, the church is irrelevant if the truth is not there, I believe. And isn't that what society is about? Isn't that what government is about today? There is no truth. There is nothing. Nothing makes sense anymore. And we feel as confused as the world sometimes. Years ago, a lady that I know, she was in my Bible school class. And uh, she came. She was lonely. She had kids, and she didn't want to live alone anymore. And she got online with this guy from Vancouver, and she said, Beverly, I want you to pray because I'm going to bring them to my home and uh, we're going to get to know each other more and we're planning on getting married. And all the class were like applauding because she 
you know, was going to bring this guy over, and she finally found a man. And I wasn't happy. I said, sweetheart, you're not doing the right thing. And she said, what do you mean? I said, you're not doing the right thing. Bringing that man into your home is not going to be good for you. It's not going to be good for your kids. I said, I don't, I don't feel that at all. I said, I'm just being honest. Well, the class was a little bit upset because I didn't tell her what they wanted me to tell her or what she wanted to hear. So anyway, she did what she wanted to do, and it was only a matter of months. Her daughter was brought to me, and she was so distraught. She was brought into my office, and she actually lost it. She ended up on a psych ward. I don't know all the details to that, but she ended up on a psych ward, and I don't know if she's ever come off. But things from her past, by bringing this man into her home, things from her past father and all that came back, and it, it did a trick on her. And so then one morning at the altar, about a year later, I was standing about there. This woman came up to me, breaking her heart, saying, Bev, I've made the biggest mistake of my life. Now, we're not condemning. God understands. He understands our loneliness. He understood why she did what she did, probably. But she was broken. And she said, oh, to God, why didn't I listen at the time? Why didn't I listen? Folks, people who truly love you, people who truly love you will sit with you and they'll try to give you the best advice they can according to the Word of God. They will do it with a heart that makes a difference. So if we want to mature, to live out Christ, we have to focus on growth. We have to get there. We need to help members to grow more and more. I'm going to quickly go through these points. If I'm seeking God to know the Son of God, all other goals I believe in my life become unattractive to knowing God. Whatever consumes your heart and mind once you fall in love with Jesus Christ, I think the others become dim in comparison. Do you agree with me this morning that once you get a taste of Jesus, a taste of his glory, that nothing else satisf satisfies quite the same? I see people aiming for everything material, for everything. Now, God doesn't mind us having the good things. He actually gives it to us. But if it becomes priority in our lives, everything else will come chaotic around us. But once Jesus is center, once he's the focus of our hearts and our lives, he becomes the light of your life. Even on those difficult days when you think, I'm not going to make it, Jesus shows up because you know who he is and you call upon him. And once he shows up, there's something that radiates inside you. Something jumps, leaps within you to say, I love this Jesus. He will help me get through. He will be there with me. He will be my focus and I will get through. And I pray today, folks, with all that's within me, that you will go after Jesus Christ. The real God, after Jesus. Not things, not people's affections, not their approval. You will go after Jesus Christ because he's everything. And nothing, this greatest commandment, he knew what he was doing when he gave it to you. Because he said, if you put me first, nothing will compare to me. Nothing will ever Look the same to you once you put Jesus at the center of your life. So if you want to be a mature person which in, in whom Christ truly lives, you need to focus on your growth. You, only you can figure that out. Is it reading the word more? Is it saying a prayer? Is it recognizing what the fruit of the Spirit is versus the, 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 the acts of the flesh? I don't know. But I know that Jesus is everything. We want Christ to be known in our lives more than anything else. And when you get there, you know you got the real gospel. When you're more concerned about somebody, if you're sitting talking with them, they think, I've just sat, with Je sat down with Jesus. You ever had that said to you? Sometimes when I'm in counseling and I believe the Holy Spirit takes over, I don't believe it's yourself, people will get up and they say, Pastor Bev, I just feel like I've been with Jesus. Why? 
because this word is Jesus. You're teaching this word. They've got to feel Jesus. It's nothing we could say, folks. He uses our foolishness. But the word of God, when we teach it, when we love God, we preach Jesus. We encourage every member to do his or her work. He says in verse 16, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does his own special work, it helps the other parts grow so, so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. If we're referred to as a hospital, just like there, are, there have got to be nurses and doctors on every shift, the church has to have its members on every shift to be a healthy church. I'm telling you seriously, folks, there's always room for you in this church. Grace, Charlton's wife, phoned me, came in to see me and said, Pastor Bev, I want to do the phone calls to wish people a happy birthday. Oh, to God, we would have more people come and say, I want to do something in the church. I don't say that as a criticism to you or working lots or whatever, but folks, the only way the church works is as everybody goes to work. It's like a family doing dishes. Right? Together. If you let three over there play around, they're making another mess. You get them all doing dishes, they're working together. You know some of the greatest times in my family, being that we had nine kids and my mom would cook like this big jigs dinner, Newfie style. I could see how tired she'd be at the end, drinking her cup of tea and her biscuit. And we'd all have to go to work and do dishes. But how much carrying on we did doing dishes. And you know today I love doing dishes, I don't mind doing dishes, because I had to do them. And we'd, we'd be at that sink for an hour doing dishes from jigs dinner, I'm telling you. It was crazy. But you know what? We didn't mind doing dishes after a while. It became a place, a social place for the family. It became a place where we united around just having fun and laughter and, and discussing the things of the day. If you do not teach your kids to become involved, they become lazy agents for society. We all got to teach them to be productive, right? Now, they learn their own ways sometimes, but we have to teach them. And a healthy church is where everybody fits in. Sometimes we want a certain kind of church. We want it to look a certain way. No, the street person is just as important as the preacher. Do you get that? You would be privileged to go sit with the street person because that's what Jesus did, right? The street team here that go out, God bless them for going every Saturday, taking time to be with the homeless on the streets. I've had homeless people tell me more about God than some of the church people. Some of them have been ministers that just fell down on luck and different things, but they tell me a lot about God. So you won't go wrong by getting out there, folks. God wants us to get out there. Number four, of course, in verse 13, the correct measurement of real growth is a statue measured by Christ's fullness. Are we like Christ? And that's what we have to ask ourselves when we react badly. I remember years ago doing a women's conference and the thing I put up, and it changed a lot of women's life, lives, but I remember God showing this to me. When I was reacting to my family or to my husband, was I acting out of the fruit of the Spirit or was I in the acts of the flesh? Go look that up this week as a little bit of homework for yourself. And I would go time and time, I had them listed on my fridge, and I would go and think, oops, in the wrong section. Oops, in the wrong section. Oops, I'm not doing it right. And it would just remind me that I was not in the right category. And so often that was just a gentle reminder to get my attitude straight, to go back and try to do it right. You see, we've got to present Jesus Christ. We could get money in here and decide a lot of big churches where you could do a bowling alley. You could do all kinds of stuff, right? None of those things are bad sometimes. But are we feeding the poor? Are we going to the hospital to pray with the sick? Greatest disappointment for me in Christian, my Christian walk is when I went to prison to minister there. And when I got there and I was carried through and seen all of these young women and young men that had screwed up in life, so broken, so hopeless. And the, the, the little chaplain, he was 70 years of age, and we were there, and we had such great time. Uh, you know, we had a band with us and all that. I remember them saying to us after, 
I wish you'd come back. And I said, well, don't anybody in Edmonton come? Don't any of the churches come? This is Fort Saskatchewan, folks. He said, nobody comes. Nobody comes to prison to minister. He said, I'm the only one. I can't even get another pastor to come here with me. What does the Bible say we're to do? We're to set the prisoner free. If we don't go, who's going to go? And so, folks, the darkness becomes darker. I'm going to ask the team to come. We're going to do communion. Paul's message to the church is to be faithful to the calling of God. Today, the church seems to have lost its identity somewhat. Who are we? What are we here for? The apostle, I believe, is calling us back through the scripture to the great purposes of God, which the church was established for. And I believe with all my heart, when we look at this and we ask ourselves the question, God, what do you have me to, want me to do? What am I here for? What did you place me on this earth for? I believe God will bury, he will come. I believe with all my heart, he's going to come and show you. You can start, Robert. You can bring, call the servers and just start so we don't waste time. So why do you and I exist? Ephesians 4, 1 says this. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So that's why we're here. As a prisoner of the Lord. Are you a prisoner of the Lord? Do you look at yourself that way? I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. When I was on vacation, I watched the last movie that was put out about Paul. And as I watched, Derek fell asleep on me, as usual. <laughs> He's getting old. <laughs> no, he, he, we had a long day and he fell asleep. But I was so intrigued by Paul's life. So intrigued that I stayed and watched it. And it was probably 12, 12.30 when I turned off the TV. But I, I watched as he said time and time again, I am a prisoner of Christ. I am here. And he, and he taught people how to love people by laying it down. And I believe God sometimes does that. He gives us even movies like that to remind us of what we're here for. The problem is not that society is too dark or evil, folks. It's only that there's not enough light. The church needs and can awaken overnight and be an instrument that God changes the community in literal ways. All that the church needs has been given to us. All that the church needs has been given to us. It's Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Do you believe when you're at work that all you need to give is Jesus Christ? You see, I think it's our lack of faith that prohibits us from saying and being what we need to be. And the only thing that increases faith is that you have an encounter with God. That you have a one-on-one -on -one where he shows up in your sacred space and shows you who he is. You hear many stories of Muslim people where the light of Christ shows up in their room and they will go to the ends of the earth and be persecuted for the gospel after that. Why? Because they've had a real encounter with Jesus Christ. And if you've not had one, people say to me, well, how do you know God's speaking to you? How do you know that God showed up? How do you know? You'll know, folks. He's too magnificent not to know when he shows up. He will lighten the room. He will change the heart. He will do a miracle that only God can do. And you will be resurrected from faith to faith, from glory to glory. And up it goes. Oh, come on. Let's preach the gospel with love. So often we get caught up in the politics of church. We get caught up in who's doing what in the church. Get your eyes off of it. Call on the name of Jesus Christ for your neighbor who has cancer. More worry more about that than you do. He can govern his own church. Amen. He can take care of you and I. 
He knows what he's doing. He does. But if you get off track in all of the foolishness that can go on in life, you will miss the moment, that encounter with the brilliance of the glory of Jesus Christ. I don't want you to miss it. I'm here to teach that time and time again. You know, there's never a week in my life, and I, don't, I say this very humbly, but if I go any amount of days without God seeing, showing up in my world, speaking to me, doing something in my life, there's an urgency in my heart that cries out to God and says, God, I need to see you. I need to feel you. You can't preach this gospel without it, folks. But oh, in those moments, coming to church this morning, I prayed for you. I prayed for this church. I didn't want to come in. I thought, God, do I have to go in? I'd like to just go out and pray. But as I was praying, this song came on the bridge. And I knew God put it there for me. Oh, what a beautiful. And the Holy Spirit came above me in my car. And I thought, oh, God, you are so beautiful. You are so great. You are so wonderful. And folks, if you don't have that this morning, pray as we sing this song that you will just have an encounter with God. Say, God, I need you here this morning. I need to feel you. If we could sing that, Lisa, for a few minutes before we do communion. You can stand with us. We're going to sing this song as the service continues.